lot of these folks have uh, have taught me how to how to worship a language that's not necessarily my native worship language. And so uh, a couple of things I've learned. Uh, a Latino friend of mine just told me that uh, for Latin music, you're generally supposed to tap on the strong rhythmic beats, which is like one and three. So uh, why don't you try doing that? Of course, they're probably be going on those days. Okay, that's good. We got that down. And, and now with most gospel music, you end up clapping on two and four. So you stop clapping for a second. So two and four would be like this. Whoa, one, two. All right, so we got that. And uh, most white people don't know how to clap. So we're just going to kind of skip over that. But since the Bible tells us that through Christ Jesus we're not just reconciled to God, we're reconciled to each other, I think we should reconcile our clapping. So we should clap on one and three and two and four at the same time. So it'll go a little bit like this. And you can say this too. Uno, two, taste, four. Uno, two, taste, four. Uno, two, taste, four. Uno, two, taste, four. And you just keep clapping and you don't stop until you're uh, so far off and ready. God, this morning we just come before you. We want to be people who love justice, who show mercy to the world, walk humbly with you, God, this morning. That's why we're gathered here. That's why we're gathered to learn, to be a part of this conference, God. We know none of that is possible unless you are the center of our lives. None of that is possible unless we 
are desperate for you. God, that's only possible if you are the air that we breathe, God, the, the food that we eat, our sustenance, our meaning, our motivation in life, God. That's what we come uh, to say to you this morning. This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your holy presence living in me. This is my daily bread. This is my day. strength as we go into the world and desire to, to love others, to serve others, to end oppression in the world, to fight injustice. God, fill us right now. God, inspire us to go out into the world. Make, make us channels of peace.
make us a channel of your peace. Make us a channel of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us love. Where there is hatred, let us love. Where there is wrong, let us forgive. Where there is wrong, let us forgive. Yes. Where there is pain, there is enough. Sing that again. Make us a channel. Make us a channel of your peace. Let us Where there is hatred, let us love. Where there is wrong, let us forgive. Where in the pain has been enough. Where the pain has been enough.
go ahead and have a seat. Good morning, CCDA. Good morning. I'm Kit, and I'm a CCDA board member, and I have the precious and beautiful privilege of leading us in prayer this morning. So, what I say to the kids in our ministry, so if you would close your eyes, <laughs> kind of get focused a little, so we can talk to the Lord together what a privilege it is to be one body in Christ, what a privilege it is to be here at CCDA, so united in heart and mind, what a privilege it is to go to prayer together. <clears throat> so Father, we thank you. We thank you for your design and your hand on this organization. We thank you for these 18 years. We thank you for the precious things that have already happened. Uh, up until this morning that indicate, God, that you are here among us. And Lord, I want to especially thank you for St. Louis and how um, you design it ahead of time for a city to host. We know, God, that hospitality means love of strangers. And we thank you that we've already experienced that here. We thank you, Lord, that uh, you want to do a great and mighty thing in St. Louis we ask you, God, that you would be revealed behind, outside the walls, uh, here in St. Louis, in the church. God, we know there's issues of racism and all divisions and all unresolved here, but we know, God, it also exists in our cities. Jesus, would you reveal yourself beyond the walls in our cities? We ask for a particular blessing for St. Louis. And Lord, I want to pray for these uh, folks here, these good folks of CCDA who traveled far, many of them and are tired, many of them and have come, some wounded and weary, and maybe some burned out, maybe some struggling, Lord, to um, reconnect with that passion they once had. And so, Lord, I pray for this CCDA that it would be a place of anointing for individual conversations for workshops, for divine appointments, that somehow, Lord, we would accidentally bump, it, bump into the right person that we need to be with and talk to who will take us to that next step. God, use this time in a precious way. This isn't a vacation. This is an opportunity to go home changed, equipped, different. Oh, God, do that. And Father, I want to pray for this precious group of people that are getting ready to come up, this Kingdom Economic Panel. Father, we have so much to learn from them. They've been spending an awful lot of time thinking about your heart as it relates to economics and the poor. And God, I pray that you would inspire them, that you would be powerful in and through them, and our hearts would be tender toward the things they have to say. Oh, Lord, teach us this morning through these people. And God, we thank you for uh, this time together. We thank you for this precious gathering. Oh, God. Be here among us this entire time. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Good morning, CCDA. Good morning. All right, well, it's my great pleasure to be here in St. Louis with you this year. I had the privilege of being in Philadelphia last year, and I'm hoping to be in Miami next year, so please put in a good word for me. Um, well, to gain some favor with some of you, I have some freebies. Do people like free stuff? All right, well, I need to hear some noise if you like free stuff. All right, well, I am supposed to advertise these fancy t-shirts. These are on sale for $8 at the hospitality booth. Now, if you want a free t-shirt, can you make some noise, please? All right, heads up. I'm going to throw them out there. All right, I got one more over here. All right. I can't throw with my left hand. I'm sorry. All right, one in the middle over here. All right. Okay, well, I know that you are um, coveting my fancy fanny pack from back there. And these are on sale for $5. So if you want a fanny pack, these are all the rage in L.A. right now. So if you want a fanny pack, can I hear you? All right, right here, actually. There you go, sir. 
All right. Well, I know we have some scary bouncers at the front door here. Did anyone have to give away their, their coffee before they came in? Did anyone have to surrender their coffee? If you did, I'm going to give you a free mug. All right. Well, run up here. If you had to surrender your coffee, first person to run up here, you get this free coffee mug. These are on sale for $2. All right. All right. And of course, Dr. Perkins gave me a book right before I came out. Oh, I I'm sorry. I, I might have to keep this one. It was given to me personally by Dr. Perkins. So he wants you to go out and buy this book with justice for all. I, you didn't know I was keeping it, huh? <laughs> all right. Well, down to business. I only have five minutes. All right. Now, we at the CCDA are trying to create a family-friendly environment. So if you brought your kids, we are offering for the first time free, not free actually, uh, child care for a dollar an hour per child. So if you go down to boardroom 21, yeah, that's, that's worth a hand. If you didn't, next year I think they might be, uh, they might be offering that again. So for a dollar an hour, go to boardroom 21, check in there, and we have created a, a child-friendly environment down there. Um, do we have any singers in the house? Okay, we got three. We might, it might not be a mass choir, but the CCDA is going to have a CCDA mass choir um, on Saturday, I believe. So we are going to have a rehearsal on Thursday, today, and Friday at 4 p.m. right here. Please, more than three people show up. All right, do we have any other Asian American brothers and sisters in the house? All right, good, I'm not the only one. Okay, we are going to have a networking meeting today at 4.30 down by the horses, the giant horses. We're going to meet there at 4.30, and then we are going to go out for dinner together after that with board member Craig Wong. Um, DeVos, anybody associated to DeVos? They are a big sponsor for us here. And uh, DeVos Leadership will be meeting at TGI Fridays from 5 to 6.30 p.m. to network together. Now, if any of you have any questions or if you need any help, look for a person in a bright orange t-shirt and they can direct you. Um, we are the Christian Community Development Association. Now, we have some great speakers. We have some great seminars this afternoon. But if you miss out on the associating part of this conference, then you don't miss the point. So we want you to be intentional about meeting your fellow brothers and sisters in the ministry. So today at 1130, if you hold up your booklet, this is very important. Look at your booklet on page 47. It will show you a list of different networking tracks. Um, there is a list of rooms and facilitators and areas of interest. So at 11.30, um, out here there will be some affordable sandwiches and other lunch items. So you can grab your lunch and head on down to the room of your choice. Or if you're not hungry yet, you can uh, network for a little bit and then grab lunch with the people that you meet. So please check that out at 11.30. Um, other announcements will be made available in the Daily Voice, that orange sheet that was on your, uh, on your seat last night. You can go to the information booth or registration and pick one up there. If you have an announcement that you'd like to make, please go see one of those people at that booth. Um, and without further ado, I am going to introduce the panel on Kingdom Economics. Now, please show them some love. Thank you. Well, we want to move quickly because at the end of some presentations, we expect you to have some questions of disagreement, some questions of affirmation, or some questions that are, are of a confusion to you. Um, and so please listen and then have questions ready so that our panel members can respond to them. My name is Gordon Murphy, and I am going to facilitate our panel, but the experts are the three folks that sit to my left. My far left, Joe Holland, um, a lawyer, an entrepreneur from New York, from Harlem. Um, and uh, Wayne Gordon pointed out to me this morning, he's also a playwright. Um, Joe, are you proud of that? <laughs> Joe, uh, with a number of businesses in, in Harlem and also with some real estate development work he's doing. Next to Joe is Dr. Jimmy Dorrell. Dr. Dorrell is in Waco, Texas with Mission Waco and um, a board member of CCDA. And to Jimmy's right is Dr. Amy Sherman, an author, a researcher, a, a speaker. And um, will uh, she is a CCDA board member also. She is a seasoned CCDA board member. Jimmy Dorrell is a seasoned and old CCDA board member. All right, so 
Economic development. For five years, I was uh, blessed to lead this association. And as I was traveling around the country meeting with you, I think what you all said to me, one of the weakest pieces of our desire to transform the community back to where God intended it was, that we economically are struggling. We economically are not understanding. What are we supposed to do to help change this community so that economically people have jobs and that people are starting businesses? So this panel and this time is an attempt to begin to stimulate your thinking about how do we do economic development in the community. So uh, Amy will address a biblical and theological perspective. Jimmy will address the universality of economic development from a global perspective and some of those principles. And Joe, who has started the businesses and um, dealt with the ups and downs of businesses, talk about the reality. What's when it meets the road? So that's how we're going to proceed and then quickly get your questions and uh, give you a chance to, to shoot back and to, to help you better understand. Amy. Okay, great. Hopefully you can get the uh, PowerPoint up there. Well, as Murphy said, our panel's about business, and my friends here are going to tell you about some of their good stories about revitalizing their communities through business development. And um, what we have to realize is when we talk about business development, oh no, we're talking about capitalism. Next slide. So I've got my little oh no uh, symbol. Is the PowerPoint yes, up? Slide's going. Chad, how are we doing? Now, Noel is the executive director of <laughs> Next slide. I know that there's a wide range of opinions about capitalism in this room, uh, so I've been, uh, apparently I'm getting punished for my sins here because Murphy has given me the rather unenviable and impossible task of trying to talk about the Bible and the free market in 12 minutes or less. Um, so, <laughs> uh, so we're going to, uh, we're going to be merciful to each other today. Uh, next slide. Um, because I am inevitably going to step on a lot of toes. I'm probably undoubtedly going to be mischaracterized and misunderstood. Uh, so I ask that we would be merciful. Uh, uh, next, uh, next slide. Um, okay, so I have 11 minutes left. Um, these gentlemen are going to talk about their efforts uh, to revitalize their community through business development. I would suggest to you, I would propose to you, that those efforts were undergirded by certain assumptions and that certain conditions had to prevail in order for them to be able to be successful in their business ventures. So what I want to try to do is share with you about how I think the assumptions that underlie their business development are consonant with biblical teaching on economics and how the conditions that had to obtain for them are consonant with free market principles, okay? So I want to talk about these uh, assumptions and these conditions and how they relate to biblical teaching. Okay, so the first assumption I think that uh, these gentlemen had to have is that business is okay, that it's morally legitimate, and that profit is okay and morally legitimate. How does that relate to biblical teaching? Well, I would argue that that is consonant with biblical teaching. Um, Throughout the Bible, there's sort of an assumption that business life is normal. There's an assumption that, that markets naturally arise, that people are going to be involved in production, they're going to be involved in trade. Otherwise, we wouldn't have the many, many, many injunctions that we have in Scripture telling us how to behave in the marketplace, how to be moral people as we engage in business transactions. Um, we could have the next slide, please. If you wanted to find one particular place in the Bible that really talks about kind of the business world, you can't really do better than Proverbs 31. This, of course, is the story of the woman that we're all supposed to emulate. And you know what? She's actually a Christian business person, isn't she? She, she trades. She invests. She's uh, financially literate. She's a hardworking person. Uh, she produces. She sells. And because she is successful in her business, she's able to provide well for her family. She's also a devout, godly person who shares God's heart for the poor and therefore is open-handed. Next slide, please. Well, if we wanted to just proof text, I would be done, right? We'd be able to say, hey, Proverbs 31 says that the free market is a fine thing. I can wipe my hands or we could be done. But of course, if we really want to think well about these issues, we have to look at overarching biblical themes. What, what does the Bible say uh, in, in broad stroke about economic life? 
Um, we have produced a couple of handouts for you that are uh, up here on stage. Uh, one of them is by me, one is by Jimmy. These are to try to help you think about um, kind of biblical teaching in these large themes, because I'm only going to be able to highlight a couple of things very briefly. I'd also invite you to uh, attend my uh, workshop at Friday on, at 1 o'clock. All right, so the first assumptions are that, um, that business is okay, the profit is okay. The next assumptions are that people should be free to go into business and that, in fact, we have talents and creativity to make business development possible. These are assumptions that underlie what Joe and Jimmy have tried to do in their cities. How do those relate to biblical teaching? Well, clearly, the Bible is, God is very uh, pro-freedom. He sets us in uh, the environment that he's created us, and he gives us freedom. And he says, I want you um, to use the talents I've given you. Um, God is a creator. He made us in his image. That means that a fundamental part of our identity is that we are creative people. One of the ways that we express that is in the business world. So we need to have the freedom to be creative people. Next slide, please. All right. Now, another assumption that underlies their work as they try to use business to end poverty in their communities is that it's actually possible to create new wealth, that it's actually possible to start businesses that will have positive sum benefits, that the world is not a zero-sum world, that it's possible to have win-win transactions. In short, when these gentlemen looked at poverty in their community, they said to themselves, how are we going to address that? I'm sure that they thought about distributional issues. How do we look at the resources that exist and how do we equitably distribute those resources? But they also had to say, looking at distribution exclusively is not enough. We can't just talk about how to slice up the pie, we've got to talk about how to make the pie bigger. In other words, we've got to talk about production. We've got to talk about wealth creation. And that also is an important biblical theme. God sets us in the natural environment and he expects us to be fruitful and to multiply. And that has more to do than just about raising babies, okay? Um, God does not expect us to sit around and look at grain. He expects us to turn grain into bread. He does not expect us to sit around and eat all the seeds until there's no seeds left. He expects us to plant the seeds in the ground, to grow trees, to grow fruit, to create new wealth. Okay? Creation of wealth is a very important biblical theme. Next slide, please. A further assumption that underlies business development is this idea that the person that takes the risk to start the business ought to be able to enjoy the fruits of that business. In other words, we're talking about privately held property. Now this I know is a, is a controversial subject. God is the ultimate owner of all things. He's the creator of all things. He's the ultimate owner of all things. And so there is ultimately a limit on private property. But it is also the case that God created the world in such a way that he made us, human beings, his vice regents, over all of his possessions. And he gives us real stewardship. And my friends, we cannot exercise real stewardship unless we have real responsibility and real authority. And that means that we have privately held property. This is a, a fundamental tenet of both Old and New Testaments. For example, in the Old Testament, when the division of the promised land happened, it didn't go to the government. It was divided by family. It was divided by tribe. In the New Testament, of course, we have the beautiful teaching in Acts 4 about the, the believers sharing their resources. I think that's a beautiful thing. But it wasn't, it, it wasn't that private property was set aside. Because in Acts chapter 5, when Ananias and Sapphira come, um, they get in big trouble, don't they? But why do they get in big trouble? The Apostle Paul, Peter is very careful to say, you're not in trouble because of private property. He says, the property was yours to do with as you wished. He said, after you sold it, the money was yours to do as you wished. They did not get in trouble because of private property. They got in trouble because of lying. Okay? Next slide, please. All right? So these are the various assumptions, and of course there's many more, but I don't have time to talk about them. There are also certain conditions. Do we have the conditions slide? And you need to click through the conditions slide so that they all appear at the same time. There are also certain conditions that have to obtain when they go to start a business. Joe, I think, is going to talk to you about Ben & Jerry's franchise in New York City. All right? Now, let's say that all of the current ice cream uh, owners, uh, shop owners went to the mayor in New York City and said, you know, we're actually really happy with the ice cream stores here in New York, and we don't want any new ones. We want you to pass a law that says we shouldn't have any more ice cream shops, okay? My friends, that would not be the free market, right? 
One of the basic principles of the free market is called low barrier to entry. All right? Joe needed to be able to start a new business. Okay? Secondly, another principle of the free market is that access to credit should not be denied on non-economic grounds. When Joe wants to capitalize his business, go and get a small business loan, if he goes to the bank and the banker says, Joe, I'm not going to give you a loan because you're a man and not a woman. Or Joe, I'm not going to give you a loan because you're black and not white. Or Joe, I'm not going to give you a loan because you're not a Buddhist. Right? All of those would be discriminatory on non-economic grounds. Now, if Joe went to the bank, used the restroom, scribbled out a business plan on the back of an envelope, brought it to the loan officer and said, give me a million dollars for my new business, the loan officer could say, no, your business plan is really stupid. I'm not going to give you the money. All right? But discrimination on non-economic grounds is, is fundamentally opposed to, to the philosophy of the free market. Another condition that had to obtain is that there has to be strong institutions of public justice that protect the rights of owners, workers, and consumers. Okay? Now let's suppose that Joe starts his ice cream store and then on Fridays the police were to come in and hold a gun to his head and say, give me all the profits that you've made this week. Or let's suppose that the mafia came in on Friday and held a, a gun to Joe's head and said, give me all the profits that you've made this week. All right? That would be theft. It's important that the free market is embedded in institutions of public justice that protect business owners' rights so that that sort of thing doesn't happen, that that sort of thing is criminalized and prosecuted. Similarly, if Joe said, Amy, come work for me in my, in my uh, ice cream store and I'll pay you $1,000 a month. And so I go to work for Joe and at the end of the month he says, you know what, I don't feel like paying you. All right? There has to be institutions of public justice that make that illegal and that give me redress as a, labor, a laborer to, to prosecute him in civil court. Finally, institutions of public justice has to protect free market conditions in such a way that the consumer is also uh, protected. If I go into Joe's ice cream store and there's a big sign that says, for $5 I can have a 10 ounce ice cream cone, and I pay $5 and he gives me a 5 ounce ice cream cone, that's fraud. And I need to be able to, be able to um, complain against that and have the system recognize that. There is so much more to be said on this topic. I do invite you to look at the handout and to come to, to the workshop. But those are just some of the assumption of conditions that have to pertain in order for us to be able to have business development. And although a lot of that was really quick, I hope that you can see how those things are in fact consonant with important biblical themes. Excellent. Thank you, Amy. <laughs> Jimmy. My name is Jimmy Dorrell. I am uh, the executive director of Mission Waco in Waco, Texas, which is a relatively small community of about 125,000. I'm also younger than Gordon Murphy. <laughs> um, in 1969, I became a youth director of a local church. I remember being interviewed by the deacons, and the chairman of the deacons asked me if I had ever had an economics class. And I laughed because I thought, how foolish. I'm a theology major. I, uh, I am uh, spiritual. I understand Greek and Hebrew. Uh, and I, I never understood what I was being asked. Now, some 30, 40 years later, I wish I'd had an economics class. Because I realize how much we miss in ministry if we do not understand some of the basic principles of the way systems work. In 1978, my wife and I um, were privileged to move into an economically depressed neighborhood. It was a neighborhood that had been very wealthy in the early days, uh, where the rich lived in large houses. And over time, like in many of your cities, uh, as the poor and the late civil rights movement began to move across the river, mostly African Americans, into this nice neighborhood, and the white fight began, uh, an economic upheaval happened. Uh, not only did we have uh, the white flight to the suburbs, but we also had the business community leave. And so when we moved into that old neighborhood in 1978, there was virtually nothing left. The few businesses that were there were uh, predatory in every sense of that word. Taking loaves of bread that should be sold for 30% less day-old bread and taking advantage of the people who were there. Our streets were full of crime. We had prostitutes working in the corners and crack dealers everywhere uh, down the street. And um, it was a very frightening neighborhood as we moved into that neighborhood and, and began to try to make a difference. And, uh, and we did what we knew how to do. We started with children. We did what many of you do. We began programs. And in those programs, we began to love kids and began to um, hang out with teenagers. We built a basketball court on our property, and the kids began to come. And eventually, we had mamas show up with children who were in domestic violence and needed help. And in a very natural 
uh, building kind of way, uh, we began to do programs. Mission Waco today has 26 different programs that serve the poor in an empowerment model. But in those early days, uh, we didn't know what we were doing. Like many of you, you just start and do what you know to do and build those relationships. And I remember um, the early struggles of trying to understand the difference that we talk about here at CCDA between what we call charity and empowerment. I grew up under that model of charity. I, I knew my neighbors needed help, and we needed to find ways to, to assist them. And, and I was caught early on uh, from a background of a wealthy community thinking the best way is just to provide money. But it didn't take long to realize there's never enough money. Uh, we would have to find ways to provide help. But it wasn't just the fact that uh, we needed to provide financial assistance. It was the dignity piece that I never understood. And so for many of you here, uh, just beginning in these ministries, uh, the dignity of the poor is so critical to our ministries, and we have to understand that. Well, uh, my background is rugged individualism. I grew up uh, working for Mr. Quinn. When I was 12 years old, I went to the drugstore, and I mopped, and I swept, and he taught me how to work. And in those early days, the work ethic was created. And so most of my life has been driven by a hyper kind of individualism. And now I was with people in the neighborhood who had not worked. Uh, before the Welfare Reform Act, uh, many of the grandmas and then mothers and now third generation of poverty where the work ethic seemed to be gone. And all I knew was to tell them to get a job, only to find out that they didn't know how to get a job. They didn't have the background for jobs. And so uh, we began to explore what would it take to create a model of employment training that would do pre-employment work maturity and eventually find ways to get Christians to employ our people. And that has been a driving force of our ministry, one way of poverty alleviation. There are many uh, that we recognize. But I came to understand that we have some historical baggage. And so bear with me just a moment. I'll, I want to go through just a few of those. Uh, first of all, I, I think most of us uh, realize that there, there was a Greek dualism, an elitism that many of us came from where somehow we the affluent thought that our privilege was to sit around and talk about, uh, as the Greeks did, the higher things of life and that work was relegated to the leftover people, ordinary jobs, uh, boring jobs, and that my goal in life was to make enough money so I could talk about spiritual things, uh, whether it be the church or in the neighborhood, but that common work had very little value. Fortunately, we had the Reformation that began to deal with some of these kinds of issues. Martin Luther, John Calvin began to redeem the concept of work. For many of us, the idea of um, career has driven us. Many of you that are college students have spent much of your time asking yourself, what am I going to do? How am I going to make money to pay the bills? And a careerism began to take over in those areas that just basically pushed us to ask us how to make money. And for those of us, particularly those of us uh, more uh, associated with individual wealth, careerism meant finding the best job to make the most money. And if I had a little leftover time, then I would do what God wanted me. Fortunately, Luther began to take the idea that it wasn't the elitism of the Greek culture that said we escaped to the monastery to be spiritual, that you could find a sense of call in ordinary work. And in that uh, historical background... Uh, Luther talked about our stations in life. And he said that, that really whatever job you have could be redeemed with a vocational call. If you're washing dishes in the kitchen, uh, not to be, uh, feel like that doesn't have purpose and meaning. Because somehow in the midst of washing dishes, you could find God's purpose in that location. John Calvin expanded on that idea and he said, no, it's more than that. It's also a sense of your giftedness. God made you a certain way. And in that certain giftedness, you need to find your area of greatest influence. And the concept of vocation reemerged. Now, you and I are familiar with that here at CCDA because we understand that that vocational call, that klesis, is a deeper sense of who we are than our jobs. Many of us, many of us here are caught up in, in 50, 60-hour work weeks, and, and we just try to find a little time after work to go do what we think God has really called us to. On the other hand, there are a few of us privileged in this uh, assembly today that in an affluent nation have the privilege to be able to be paid to do what we feel called to do. Now please understand this is a privilege of wealth and that the folks that I work with internationally don't have that privilege. Uh, I have a brother here today from uh, Haiti and I'm privileged that CCDA was a part of him getting to come here today. 80% uh, unemployment. 
Uh, there's no privilege to sit around and, and just work on vocational things. There's work to be done just to, to get through. We go work in India with a, a man named Abraham who spends an incredible amount of his daily job in things that really he doesn't want to do, but he has to survive. He's got to pay the bills. We go to work with Roberto Mendoza in Mexico City who works in the barrios, and, and his sense of call is church planting among the poor. But he has to do a um, truck business during the daytime, and it's not until about 6 o'clock that he drives an hour and a half across the city to the Barrios to begin to work with the people uh, to create new churches. But we at least discover that there is a difference between career and vocation. May I say this to you? One of the greatest things I think we need to relearn in the church is how to help our people have uh, call clarification. Uh, we have not done a good job there. Uh, we are not helping our students understand that sometimes the very career they choose may be counterproductive to their sense of God's call on their life. Well, that uh, movement uh, began to sort of redeem the concept of work, and it didn't take but one more movement called the Enlightenment that began to uh, somewhat tear that down again. The idea being that, that uh, I can do whatever I want to do. It's my life, and the rugged individualism began to reappear. Now, the last several years, as we have done ministry in our low-income neighborhood with uh, addicts and with uh, homeless and with the poor uh, children and families, we began to discover that though we were trying the best we could, that we were doing a lousy job with helping create jobs. And we still are. I, I, I'm embarrassed to be up here among this panel today because we still don't know what we're doing. We've had one new business began that we were directly responsible for, a small cafe called the World Cup Cafe. Uh, but in reality, uh, we are still trying to figure out. I remember first coming to CCDA many, many years ago and uh, hearing the tension that we face here between how do you really love Jesus and, and, and help the neighborhood and at the same time make money in that same neighborhood. The tension that usually said that we people are more social entrepreneurs like us tend to be pretty lousy business leaders because we don't like the ethics of saying that if you don't show up on time once again, we're going to have to fire you. And yet that's the mother with the two children that she has to take care of her by herself and uh, somehow she doesn't have the resources to do that. And I have to fire her to keep that business going. The struggle that we face in a CCD kind of ministry between the rules of the workplace and the rules of compassion. Well, what we've discovered through the last few years is there have been different uh, kinds of trends. And bear with me if I, I want to read just a few of those because I think it will help uh, our conversation in just a moment. The first trend I mentioned a while ago was the, tr the tension between empowerment and cheap charity. Uh, we don't need to spend much time here. Most of you understand that we embrace the concept that we have to help people uh, be a part of their own recovery. It is basic to the way God created us to create people to grow up and take responsibility for themselves. For too long, we've uh, worked with the problem of false piety that somehow says, if I give people money, then I'm better. And uh, we, we've forgotten that sometimes helping them with a job or being able to buy their own house is much more about dignity than giving people the resources they don't have. There eventually came a movement in our nation we called redevelopment. In 1949, the, the Housing Act created uh, a process called urban renewal. There in Waco, Texas, I remember just around Baylor University where I uh, lived, there was a major uh, effort to remove the blight uh, of the poor that had lived there. And it was an ugly thing if you were poor. Because houses that had been historically generational homes now were mowed down in levels so that new development could come in. The intent was good. How do you deal with pockets of poverty uh, that are in our neighborhoods? And our government has realized, I think, through many years finally that uh, we have made a mess of public housing. We've put people in a culture of poverty together, and, and that has created even more problems. Well, that's not happening as much. But we had to figure out how do we uh, do these blocks of poverty. My neighborhood still has an average income of $16,500. There's not much discretionary money. How do we help them? And so redevelopment. Down the street, there's two Section 8 housing complexes that are, have thousands of people in them, most of them underemployed or unemployed, most of them struggling on the streets with um, the issues of crack cocaine and the strug struggle of the city. How do we find ways? Well, one of the things that we have discovered 
uh, particularly with our kids, is that it's critical to get back to the, to the teens. Now, I work with the folks on the other end as well that are, are at the end of life, but we put a lot of our emphasis on redeveloping uh, work in that area with dropout recovery kids. How do you find kids dropping out of high school? In our city, at least one out of four kids never finish high school. How do we take those kids who have a relatively low work ethic and begin to help them be hired? Had it not been for Mr. Quinn, I wouldn't be here today. Who could be the Mr. Quinn for those students? And so we have worked very diligently to do pre-employment work maturity skills with urban teens. And not only to do that, but then to find ways to get those kids hired. Now, what's the reality? What odds are there that if there is one job opening that you will hire one of my dropout kids, or if you're a TANF mother, that you're going to hire her out of a pool of 100 applicants? Very little. So our work primarily is in advocacy. We've discovered that a lot of the best stuff we do is in a Sunday school class, not at the Human Resource uh, Office downtown. But if we can find the businessman or woman who is sitting in the church Sunday school class and help them realize that if they were to give our kids a chance, that they would be doing ministry. This is just a job for these kids. This is a life change. And so we found ways to help bring middle class folks into a reality that some of the best work they could do is to give these urban teens or these TANF mothers a chance to do that. And so a lot of our redevelopment work has been not so much around housing, though we uh, have a development corporation that does that in our neighborhood. But how do we get jobs for those who oftentimes can't find it? Jimmy, I need to hold you on microenterprise and enterprise amongst the poor. Let's come back to that, or you've got a handout that people can look at. I need to give Joe some time so that I can get to the questions. All right? Thank you. Joseph, can you go? Jimmy, thank you. I hope you don't mind. I'm going to stand a uh, couple of quick, if I could have my, uh, my slides up there. A couple of quick acknowledgments. It was 26 years ago when I was a student at Harvard Law School that I heard a presentation by John Perkins at a uh, church in Lexington, Massachusetts. And that was a moment that God used to touch me and encourage, inspire me to leave Harvard and, and go to Harlem, where I've been ever since. Thank you, John. I wanted to acknowledge that. I've also known Wayne Gordon for many years through uh, CCDA, and uh, I love Coach, but I want to make one thing perfectly clear. Contrary to what he might have told you and what he might say, I was a better football player in college than Wayne Gordon was. <laughs> I'm going to look at the practical side of economic development in our communities. Uh, next slide, please. And I, I think it's important to look at some strategies, and I, I call these strategies faith-based entrepreneurship and faith-based real estate development. Next slide. I'm going to run through these uh, uh, quickly. There is a biblical basis for... Uh, faith-based economic development, 2 Kings 4, 1 through 7, a widow, two sons, her husband was in a company of prophets, he died, she reached out to Elisha. She was about to lose her sons to creditors because she was so poor, they were about to enslave her family. She says, what am I going to do, Elisha? A lot of things the prophet could have told her. He could have said, well, um, you can go to your neighbors and raise a donation, maybe we'll get the profits together and, you know, we'll, we'll pray and see what we can do to address your problem. Maybe we can go to the priest or the king and get you a grant. He told her none of that. He says, what do you have in your house? She responded, I don't have anything. But on second thought, she said, well, there's a little oil. And then he gave her a business plan. He said, go to all your neighbors, get all your empty jars, and then start pouring the oil. And that's when God came in, divine intervention. The oil continued to flow until all the jars were sold. And the prophet tells her, then you can pay off your creditors, pay off your debts, and live off of the increase. So her strategy out of poverty 
was economic, was by starting an oil business. Next slide, please. This is um, Hawk Homes, homeless shelter in Harlem. You see a picture there uh, in the church basement on West 129th Street. I'm all the way to the left, um, and, and the brothers are there around the table. Uh, those are Bibles on the table. We have Bible study every morning. Um, out of the Bible study, we developed a program, Life Skills, called Holistic Hardware. We've just updated that video series, and I'll be uh, doing a workshop on that this, this afternoon at 1 if you want some more information on, on that, that program. Um, but soon after we hung up, um, we, we, we took this picture, we hung it up, and we had a funder come by who saw the picture. And as you, as you can see here, um, uh, the funder asked the question. She says, well, Joe, how come you're the only one smiling? And one of the brothers there, uh, Jerry, he's the one in the tie because he was working in, in one of the businesses. He's, he says to the, it wasn't exactly what we wanted to hear, but he says to the fund, he says, well, he's the only one that can go home tonight. And one of the other brothers, uh, Booth, who's on the end, said, yeah, but in about a year, we'll all be able to go to a home. So we were able, we didn't get the funding, uh, but it was sort of out of that sense of, you know, how do we, how do we, move forward with our business and fund the shelter that we started some businesses. And if we can go to the next slide. The Harlem Shelter finds new ways to change lives. It was the idea of enterprise. You know, how do we take what God has given us and develop enterprise around that in order to create opportunities for the men in the shelter as well as funding for the programs that we were doing. Next slide. And there were two, um, uh, two businesses that came out of it. It was based on the idea of launching businesses to serve the community. Uh, you know, what I call faith-based entrepreneurship. It has a formula, you know, a service opportunity that's helping the homeless get jobs, and raising money for the shelter, when that's combined with a market opportunity, which is looking in the marketplace and finding a need that needs to get met, leads to a triple bottom line, and that's financial, social, and community profit. Next slide. We saw this happen in, uh, in two businesses. If I could get the next slide. Harlem Travel Bureau was a business that uh, we took over and combined it, and this is about, uh, this particular article is about, we brought the first American Express travel office to Harlem in order to uh, uh, stabilize and expand the business. It was an elderly couple that run it for many years. They were about to go out of business. We took it over, you know, with the idea of creating an apprenticeship program for the men uh, in the shelter, as well as... Um, creating some, uh, some income for the shelter. We were able to direct some of the, the profits from the business to, to the shelter. And so the triple bottom line that we talk about was for the men creating the jobs as well as some income for the shelter, for the uh, community, because this was an important business for the community that was about to go out of business, as, as well as for the owners, because it was a profitable business that we were able uh, to run. Next slide. We were also able to do this, um, I think we skipped a slide, but let me talk about Ben and Jerry's. We were able to do this with a Ben and Jerry's franchise on uh, 121st, 125th Street. This was the first Ben and Jerry's that we did uh, that was done in an inner city area. Uh, also, the triple bottom line was in effect, the men got jobs in, uh, in the ice cream shop. We were able to direct some some income, some revenues from the ice cream shop to support the shelter. Uh, it helped the economic development of the Harlem community because it was one of the first uh, national franchises 
to, to come in there, and this was many years ago, this was back in 1992 before you had the uh, economic development in Harlem. And then once again, it was also a, uh, you know, a profitable enterprise uh, that, we were, uh, that we were able to run. Um, let's talk about um, faith-based real estate development real quickly. I, I'm going to be doing a, um, a workshop on this tomorrow, so um, what I, I don't get to today, we can, um, if you're interested, you can hear more about. This is the idea of, of churches, parachurches, uh, CCDA ministries who have property uh, in urban areas, uh, using that property in order to serve the community. Once again, there is a, uh, a formula. You have to assess that real estate asset, then you develop a plan for the asset, uh, then you can develop that asset, which leads uh, to a triple bottom line, which I want to illustrate quickly. Next slide. Which is not coming up. Uh, if it was, I, it would be a picture uh, of a... Um, this is actually a building that has been built on Lenox Avenue in Harlem. It was owned by a, uh, uh, a church, uh, a dilapidated structure that was um, in the community for many years. We were able to tear it down. Uh, we were able to create resources for the church so that in phase two of the project, you see where the, uh, the trees are to the left on the slide. There's going to be a new 600-seat church built, um, and the retail space uh, right there along Lenox Avenue, the church also owns, so the church benefits from a new facility as well as income from the retail. The community benefited from the blight being taken down, and uh, you know my company benefited by uh, having a, a profitable real estate transaction. Next slide. Uh, this is a, a second real estate development in Harlem church base where the church owned the land. This is Bethel Gospel Assembly, of which I'm a member uh, at Fifth Avenue and 120th Street. Uh, what we did, this was a vacant parking lot. Um, this building is under construction. At the base is a new 1,800-seat sanctuary that um, uh, the church needed to grow. Uh, part of the building will be a rental building which the church will own, so uh, uh, that's uh, ongoing income uh, for Bethel. And then there's a condominium above, uh, which uh, you know, is a, uh, uh, a profitable transaction for, for my company. And the community benefits because we are empowering the church and out of the money that the church is gaining from the transaction, they're going to be starting a, uh, a new school as well as some other outreach programs. Next slide. Just quickly, uh, we talk about some of the practical challenges. There are some risks here when we talk about uh, faith-based entrepreneurship or uh, development. There is a market risk. You know, if you run a business and you're not able to sell ice cream or you're not able to sell real estate, uh, a performance risk if you're not able uh, to serve the customers in a way where they keep coming back and um, what I call a spiritual risk we had a man who came uh, from the shelter who came in the ice cream shop and he started taking money out of the register uh, you know instead of serving ice cream and that became a big challenge is how do you uh, you know, manage the temptation for an individual in that kind of situation. Next slide. And challenges, how do you fund uh, these enterprises? You know, how do you operate them? As, and, you know, how do you strike the balance between running a profitable enterprise as well as um, continuing to serve the poor of the community? Uh, no easy answers, but it, it takes a lot of prayer and being led of the Holy Spirit. And finally, I think this is the last slide because I know I'm over time, but the opportunity as we look at economic development for CCDA is um, it's a very important one. This slide shows over the last 20 years people coming back, moving back into our cities. 
I believe God has redeemed our cities. The work that God has done through CCDA ministries and other ministries who care about the poor of the cities, people are coming back. And because people are coming back to the cities, it creates a tremendous market opportunity to do enterprise and to do business development because there is a need for services, there's a need for housing, there's a need for a lot of things that we as ministries, if we have this perspective and take these strategies, can respond to. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you, Joe. We have some time for some questions, and I'm stepping out so I can see if there's questions. Where, there's a microphone over here. Is there a microphone over here? I need you to come to the microphone if you have a question. Where's the microphone over here, somebody? We got one? They're right back there. Sorry, there's one back there. There's one over there. Can we get an orange shirt up there so they can find out what it is? Be succinct in your questions. If you have a question, and I'm going to ask the panel to be succinct because we need to keep moving. But also, there are some handouts. If you are interested, there's some handouts up here at the stage. This isn't for everyone, so we didn't pass it out to everyone. Please come out. Jimmy was not able to um, talk about some of the micro-enterprise work and some of the enterprise amongst the poor, but that's in his notes up here. So there is some materials on the stage come up. All of them are teaching some classes. Find those in your workshop. Go to the classes. Interact with them. I'm done talking. Let's get a question. You have a question over here. A quick question. Okay, this is quick. Okay. First, a comment. Um, the question or the, the teaching about eating seed needs to be expanded, especially in the black community. We are such big consumers that we don't have anything to invest. But that wasn't what I came up here to say. Uh, I work as a consultant helping churches develop projects in the community. Uh, to raise money, support, whatever, whatever. And one of the biggest problems I have in working with churches is based in Habakkuk, which says, write the vision and make it plain. Getting churches to do business plans is the biggest deterrent to getting a lot of community development going. And I think we need to talk about how do we get that accomplished. And Mr. Holland has just indicated how relevant that is. Thank you. Quick, Amy, Jimmy, Joe, how, how do we get the plants? How do we get people to be thinking about that? A succinct answer. Well, you, I mean, you've underscored the big problem, and it, it really takes an education process. A lot of churches, you know, uh, the leaders do not have the background to do the business plans and do not have the awareness to be thinking about it. So it, it is important to get put a lot of emphasis on that. Let me ask you not to come up for just a second. Just hold on. Just the, the, the handouts will be here, and for some reason we do run out. We'll make sure you get more. So let me just ask you to hold off on the handouts. I apologize. I should have done better on that one. Uh, Noel's the executive director. Um, <laughs> question over here. Uh, you touched on this. Um, working with uh, people that uh, have not been raised to have that uh, work ethic, um, I'm assuming that you have to manage a balance between uh, grace in, in, in that transition and uh, accountability. Um, I, I'd like to hear some of the strategies that you use to uh, transition people uh, into that. Jimmy, do you want to you comment yeah, on well, a succinct answer? We, um, we have a um, pre-employment work maturity program that is about three weeks long that uh, whether they be uh, urban youth or um, welfare to work moms that go through this pre-employment class and have to achieve uh, 13 levels, 13 different skills. And so once they are achieving in that, then we move to a second phase and we have found grant money or we have created uh, ways to pay then the employers in the community where our uh, students or kids can then go and work for someone. They're not willing to hire those kids yet because they don't have enough background and experience and, as you said, um, relatively uh, uninformed about the work world. But with a little bit of training early on, then we put them in a work experience in a minimum of about three weeks. We pay their salary for about $6 an hour, relatively low wages, to work for someone with the hope that they will then be hired if those kids can show up on time, if those folks are clean and sober, if they've proven themselves to be a good, good worker. And we have about 50% of those who have completed both of the first two phases that are then hired in the workplace. Don't forget also uh, one of our uh, Jobs for Life, one of our uh, exhibits out here. Look at, go some look at Jobs for Life. We've got time for a couple, three more. Do you have a question over here? Uh, underpinning the whole wealth accumulation through real estate is risk-based premium pricing for, for lending. And a lot of people don't 
don't benefit from risk-based premium pricing? And how do you go about addressing that issue when you have a group of people that are paying exorbitantly high amounts in loans because of the way the system works? Joe, you want to yeah. an answer on that one? Whoa. Yeah. You know, it's, um, you know, it's an excellent question. I mean, what you have, though, now are uh, a lot of different lending options uh, because of um, CRA and, you know, and other requirements that, uh, and other programs that banks can take advantage of. There is a competitive landscape out there where, you know, you can, uh, if you're, you know, looking for either, you know, small business loans or real estate development loans, there are, are a lot of choices and options. Plus, there are programs, for example, in Harlem, we have a uh, upper Manhattan empowerment zone as well as a, a business improvement loans where you can get, uh, you know, low income loans and, 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 and grants. So, I mean, there are, uh, it, it's challenging, but, but there are ways that a uh, business in, in an inner city can approach it in, in order to, uh, you know, get money that, uh, that works. Okay. The panelists will be up here after our session. We have one more thing after this, but if you have more questions or you want to dialogue a little bit further with Joe or Amy or Jimmy, please come up. You have a question. Yes, thank you. Um, over the years at CCDA, I've heard a lot about microenterprise and about entrepreneurship, and that's great, and uh, God bless all those doing that very hard work. But isn't it true that the majority of people in our communities and neighborhoods will work in jobs in existing companies? And if so, then I challenge us as churches and groups to do a job of, of preparing. I think we have a lot of strength in preparing. Well, let me ask, ask you to answer that first. <laughs> Is it true that, that they'll work in existing companies? Yeah, I, I think we have to remember that microenterprise is still, for the folks historically, they're on the margins. And uh, generally speaking, even if we help people, which is being done internationally, I think much better than is being done nationally. Uh, Mohammed Yunus, uh, incredible efforts, uh, Nobel Peace Prize because of his work. We're really behind uh, on understanding how to do that, I think, in our cities now. So I, I'm hoping that we'll see much more positive movement that we've not seen as much, I think, in the, in the United States. However, uh, I think that what we find is, even if those start microenterprises, they don't make a whole lot more money than those that will work in our jobs out there, but it's the pride of ownership, it's the sense of dignity that uh, comes back to your local neighborhood that is a byproduct and a very important byproduct. So I think you're, you're right. We've got to do both end. Thank you. Question over here. I think many of us, maybe even most of us, would agree that we're living in a fear-ridden culture. Uh, given the prevailing fear, what is the experience, your experience and the experience of this group in dealing with that fear and inviting people and coming people back into the distressed areas of our cities to open up stores and businesses? How do we do that in a positive way? With the fear. How do we get people to do this? Joe, are you? Yeah, you know, I, I think the, um, you know, the fear has, uh, has subsided, at least from my perspective, as a, as a minister and entrepreneur in, in Harlem. Uh, you know, things in the 25 years that I've, um, I've worked there, you know, have changed so that there's, you know, less, less fear. You know, people, I mean, there is, uh, you know, less of a crime problem now. There's less of a drug problem. There's, uh, you know, there's more enterprise and economic development, housing development going on. So, you know, I, I think we have to look at specific neighborhoods and, and areas. And once again, you know, it's about, you know, witness and education because, the fact that I've been there and others been, have been there and we've ministered and helped to build the community, I think we, we have a story to tell about how you know, God can you know, protect us and, and guide us you know, even in uh, those circumstances. So, so our faith and, our edu and, and educating. Faith and education. Let's, let's educate the people to be more aware of what's actually going on. Let's have a question over here. Kind of a nuts and bolts question is, is how do you make a profit as a nonprofit and not have the government take your status away? I know they're getting tighter on unrelated business income and all that. Um, that might, maybe you'll answer that in one of your seminars. Let me take it. No, we're going to uh, ask our lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's very, it's a good question. It's very important to get the right, um, you know, legal structure 
uh, a, a, a non-profit company can um, own a for-profit enterprise. And so what we've done is form for-profit businesses and the nonprofit is the sole owner of all the shares in that in that for-profit enterprise, and that creates a you know a legal wall between the two uh, between the two enterprises, and we found that to be a successful way to you know protect the the most important part, of which is the nonprofit and the work that it's doing. Okay, two more questions: one here and then one here. Uh, I think it's important that we recognize that you have a visionary and someone that's helping the, the churches to see the assets. We have to pick up on that. Joe Holland is showing us and telling us that churches, you have enormous opportunity. And what he's done in Harlem is phenomenal. I just wanted to add, just so that people can see the broad spectrum, how many contractors were involved in these two projects in terms of scale, how many people were employed as a result of it, and the potential of anchoring a church to own its property, build on its property, and, and provide is, is, is is enormous in terms of energizing and inspiring a community. So besides the question, Joe Holland is a phenomenon. He didn't just become successful, he, he let God put him through a torturous process to elevate. He went from small scale to mass scale. Thank you, thank you. And that asset built more assets. I think that's the critical point that we're looking at there. You want to ask the last question? This question is a great follow-up for that last statement, actually. Uh, Recognizing the scale of what we're trying to do here as far as community development goes, how do you build internal capacity? How are you finding grants or money to bring in the staff or bring in the, the personnel to finance, fund, and kind of further the vision? Because I know we all have a goal, but in order to do that, there's some very realistic you know, things we have to accomplish in the process. So how are you finding, how are you recruiting people? How are you bringing in Christians or the not Christians? Or how are you building that internal capacity to manage and accomplish the goal? Jimmy or Joe, Amy, I don't comment. That's a tough part because when you're, um, <clears throat> you know, in business, when you're doing enterprise, it's important to have a, uh, a, a team in place that is able to execute on the business plan, and that's the performance risk I was talking about earlier because if you don't execute in an effective way, you know, the market is unforgiving. I mean, you can, you can go out of business. So... Um, you know, it's about being around in the community a long time, you know, having been in, in Harlem for so long. Uh, and as the previous questioner uh, said, you know, you, you kind of learn from your mistakes and you identify people, uh, you know, who can come in and, you know, do the job in the right way. So I guess the short answer is, um, you know, being around long enough and being in the wisdom of God so that you can uh, bring the right people on board. Let me ask Amy for an additional comment, and then I'm going to close this off. Yeah, one of the things that we just recently finished for CCDA was a, a survey of you folks about what CCDA could be doing better. And one of the things that you all said was you need more connections to Christian business people. You want more of them here, and you want more teaching about that. And I think that that question really relates to that, and hopefully this is something that the CCDA as an organization is going to be able to bring to you more of uh, people that have that kind of expertise and that can answer, you know, those kinds of questions. Good. Thank you. Joe, thank you. Jimmy, thank you. Amy, thank you. Thank you. Stick with us. We have one more, um, another way of looking at poverty alleviation. We need you to stick with us and uh, we'll take just a second to transition here. Good morning. All right, we can do better than that. Good morning. My name is Adam Taylor. I serve as the Senior Political Director at Sojourners, and it is my distinct honor to introduce a track that is going to be a part of this CCDA conference called Prophetic Advocacy for the Poor. Sojourners is really an organization that is a kindred spirit to CCDA, and I'm really honored to be joined by two board members who both serve on the board of CCDA, but also on the board of Sojourners, Mary Nelson and Barbara Skinner, who are going to help us introduce the critical importance of being an advocate, of getting in the way of injustice. And I'm going to talk a little about 
some practical things you can do to engage in the work of overcoming poverty. First, Barbara's going to talk a little bit about the biblical basis for advocacy, and Mary's going to tell us some exciting opportunities as a part of this conference in terms of prophetic advocacy for the poor. Good morning, CCDA. You know, often people ask, oh, what is the relationship between serving the poor and being a prophetic advocate for the poor before governments that are oppressive? And I think that's what we really want to deal with for just a few moments this morning. I think Jesus answered it best when the disciples saw him praying and thought he prays differently. He doesn't have a prayer time. He has a prayer life. So we want one like that. And they asked him how to pray. And he said, in that prayer... In Matthew 6 10, may your kingdom come, may your will be done on the earth just as it is in heaven. And for the sake of our conversation, heaven is not the streets of gold, the crystal fountains flowing forever, but heaven, as Tom Skinner used to say, is that sphere of influence where Jesus is Lord and God is in control. And the kingdom. Uh, we know from countries that have kings and, and queens, uh, like Great Britain and Japan, is a king with a domain, with citizens, with a constitution, and with wealth to control it. Well, God is our heavenly king, and we are the citizens of that king kingdom. We are that, God, that God's kingdom is ruling not in a physical sense, but in our hearts when we say yes to Jesus Christ. God has the power to maintain that kingdom. But the essence is that God wants to rule earth through, from heaven through us. And I think that that's where the body of Christ is a little bit confused because we think of the kingdom in the future. And so we don't have to worry about it. But the Bible says a kingdom of God is in you. It means that when you show up, the kingdom shows up. Justice shows up. Peace shows up. Power shows up. Love shows up. Compassion shows up. Forgiveness shows up. Reconciliation shows up because you are the embodiment of the kingdom. Now the issue is, how do, you do, how do we do that? What, what does that look like? Because in heaven, there's no war, violence, no Darfur's, no Gina 6, no hatred, uh, no irreconciliation. But the, on the earth, that is what happens. So in essence, it's more than just your program and my program, as wonderful as they are. It's more than your service or mine, as awesome as they are. And I've met people here who have been doing some incredible things. But Darfur's is not about a program. It's about a system. It's about an evil system. Katrina, as much as the church did, was about a system that was evil. The church couldn't fix the dam. It couldn't fix the levee. Racism couldn't be fixed by the love from the church. It has to be dealt with, as King said, by the laws. The government was perpetuating evil. So what does that mean for us? I believe what it means is that we have to understand basically three things to move out of this mindset where, where we have our little program. I don't mean to be facetious, but I've got my little block I'm in my little corner, and I don't really care what the rest of the body is doing. God sees us differently. He says, I have, you are my ambassador. And when the world sees you, they see the king, they see heaven. So we are the live expression on the earth of exactly what is going on in heaven. So what does that mean? And how do we get there? Because I think most, a lot of God's people have, in essence, a, we have a, a, a self-esteem problem. We have a self-esteem problem. Many of us come with baggage. So the question is, how do we get over that? And I'll say this quickly and turn this over to Adam to talk about what we work on. One is we've got to understand who we serve. We don't serve a God. We serve the God of heaven and earth, the one who is from everlasting to everlasting, who stepped out on nothing and created everything. We've got to stop downsizing God to our level. There's no black God and white God and Asian and, and Latino God. There's a God who created all and created us to be one. That's who we, that's who we serve. Two, who, who are we? We are a little lower than the angels. We're crowned with glory and honor. That means nobody is over me or you. Get over it. Get it. Because until you get that, you won't see 
the evils of government as something that we can conquer? And thirdly, what do we do in light of who our God is and who we are? We bind our hearts together. We stop and start forgiving one another. We, start, we stop having the divisions in our language. We begin loving one another. We begin looking for policies that perpetuate racism and poverty and injustice and rural and economic injustice and war. In other words, keep doing what you're doing, but bond with others to deal with a government system that is evil so that, in essence, we will be the kingdom on the earth the way it is in heaven. Amen. Amen. I'm also a preacher, so I'm going to stand up. I believe that the persistence and the pervasiveness of poverty in America hurts the very heart of God. When 37 million Americans continue to live in the quicksands of poverty, that's one out of every eight families. When the wealthiest nation in the world can also have the highest degree of children living in poverty out of any wealthy nation, have the highest incarceration rate, and have the greatest degree of in income and wealth inequality, something is desperately wrong. Amen. More people die of poverty in the United States than of the combined casualties of war, natural disasters, and homicide. And yet poverty does not get on to the top of our evening news. These are so often invisible tragedies in our midst. But poverty has become almost like a Goliath. It has become something that seems overwhelming, invincible, and even intractable. But I believe that God has given us five smooth stones to overcome poverty in America. And I believe that CCDA uses many of these stones already. You call them the three R's of redistribution, reconciliation, and relocation. But I want to suggest that there are two additional R's in the whole the theology of R's here that we can use as advocates for justice. One is the R of removing structural barriers that keep people poor. And the second is to redeem our politics from a politics of fear and of division to a politics of the common good and of the least of these. Can I get amen? Amen. amen. What are some of these structural barriers? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> One is that wages have stagnated. And that even with the recent increase in the minimum wage, the minimum wage still can result in working families living in poverty. A barrier is in our broken immigration system that keeps 11 million undocumented workers in the shadows of our economy. A barrier is our increasingly unequal and resegregating education system that consigns so many of our children to a, to a cradle to prison pipeline. And a barrier is our incredibly high incarceration rate and criminal justice system that is neither just nor blind. But I believe that as advocates, we can help transform our politics and put the disinherited and the dispossessed back into our priorities. Our ministries and programs cannot continue to pull bodies out of the river without going upstream to figure out what are the forces and policies that are throwing them in. Or put another way, we can't continue to teach men and women to fish without helping them to own the very pond. As we heard, Katrina opened our eyes around the crisis of poverty in this country. But that teachable moment is slipping away. Many of you have heard of what are called the Millennium Development Goals, which were agreed to in the year 2000. And they pledge to cut in half the number of people around the world living in extreme poverty. But one of the things that has struck me is that we have no set of equivalent goals for the people of the United States, the people in your churches, the people in your neighborhoods, the people in your communities. We need a set of Millennium Development Goals here at home as well. And Sojourners has worked with CCDA and many others to launch a campaign called Vote Out Poverty. The goal is to get poverty under the top of our electoral agenda 
for too often it is a taboo and mis uh, neglected issue. Vote Up Poverty is calling on candidates to commit to a goal to cut poverty in half over the next 10 years. We can have conservative and liberal approaches to addressing the root causes of poverty. But what we need is a radical rehaul in political will. I can hear Christ ask us, when I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was sick, did you care for me? And yet our political system seems to respond to these questions that when I was hungry, you continued to cut social programs. When I was sick, you denied health care to children. And this brings me to an immediate opportunity that is in front of us. In addition to getting poverty under the top of our nation's political agenda, many of you have heard that President Bush has cut or has vetoed a vital piece of legislation that would expand children's health care insurance. Currently, 9 million children lack access to health care in this country. And SCHIP, which is a highly effective program that's been around for over 10 years, has expanded health care coverage to 6 million children. Both Republicans and Democrats in the House and Senate passed a bill to expand SCHIP to cover an additional 4 million children. And President Bush last week vetoed this critical piece of legislation. Children are being caught in the crossfire of our ideological politics. Our president wants to make this issue an issue of universal access to health care. When in reality, this is an effective program that helps provide needed coverage for working and low-income families. If this veto stands, this will be the death to the compassionate conservatism in this country. But I believe that we, as a people of faith, we as Christians, can use our prophetic voices to overcome this veto. The Senate already has enough votes to override the veto in this next week. And I believe the House only needs 15 votes to override a veto that will harm our nation's children. So I ask that you would join with me in this effort to protect the very livelihoods and welfare of our, our nation's most vulnerable children. In 2005, Jim Wallace, who's the head of Sojourners, gave a keynote speech at CCDA. And he offered a call to action. He invited you to join us in Washington, D.C. to stand up against an immoral budget that was trying to be passed in 2005. This is another opportunity to use our voices as the people of God to not only guarantee health care for those that are in need in this country, but also to put poverty to the top of the agenda. So I ask that you would look on your seats and you'll find two sheets. One is a support children, call Congress today sheet that is asking you to make a phone call today to your member of Congress. And you can tear off the bottom to let us know that you're committed to joining with us to ensure children have access to health care. And the other one is a vote out poverty sheet that you can also fill out. I pray that you will prayfully consider joining us in this effort to overcome poverty in America. Amen. You can place the sheets in a box outside. You can also visit the Sojourners uh, booth, which is located on the fourth floor, this floor, just outside the doors. And just quickly as we conclude, this uh, theme reminds me of uh, during the Civil Rights Movement that Martin Luther King came to the west side of Chicago. And you know how he started low and slow, and he was talking about breaking down the walls of racism, of poverty, uh, of injustice that are going on in our neighborhoods. And then after he got done preaching and had us all on our feet saying, Amen, uh, Mahalia Jackson, and those of you who are older knew her, uh, the, the great gospel singer got up and sang, Joshua, fit the battle of Jericho, and the walls are come a-tumbling down. So in order for us to be one who tear down the walls, we need some tools. We need to equip the saints. We need the tools to tear down these walls. And you have this afternoon and tomorrow afternoon uh, a whole track on these tools. And Adam's going to do uh, Prophetic Advocacy 101. And Barbara and I are doing moving from broken communities to beloved communities. Adam's doing the whole campaign on voting out poverty. Craig Wong and uh, Terry Torrey are doing war, the urban poor, and the church that are connecting the issues of war and peace. 
uh, in advocacy, and then finally, most importantly, one of the critical issues, Kit and Ian Danley are doing one on immigration. Uh, blessing, not a burden, a theological approach to the immigration issue. Get the tools so we can be effective in tearing down these walls. Thank you. All right. Well, it's time to go network. There is a reason why we have these poster-sized name tags. So please grab some lunch. Uh, look at your book. Page 47 has a list of all of the networking sessions. We are young and we are hip at the CCDA. We even have a MySpace Facebook networking session at the Cyber Cafe. So grab some lunch, meet some friends, and please go network. Meet us back here at 6.30 p.m. tonight. <laughs>